Today's guest is Serena Holmes, who is the former CEO of a multi-award winning brand experience agency turned author and licensed realtor. She has been an active real estate investor for over 10 years with a large focus on private lending. So Serena, thank you very much for being on. How are you doing today? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. And uh, yeah, it's always cool when you know I get a guest who it you know has this massive experience of whatever it is that they do right like to just by the virtue of the fact that you sold your business i mean that that's something that many entrepreneurs aspire to so yeah i'm always excited to dive into um that wealth of experience etc so i'd love for you to give us the context and like how did all of that come about what's your story and all that yeah um so as you mentioned i had been running uh, the business which is called tigress for 18 years I kind of fell into it by accident, uh, part-time as a brand ambassador, led into management and then partnership. And the founder actually left the business about four years in. So I spent, you know, the better part of the following 14 years building the company. Um, Just prior to COVID, there was about 10 of us full-time, about 2,500 part-time around the country, as well as some staff in the States. So we were a decent size. Um, There was one girl in particular in the business that I had promoted and trained to be my labor placement. I had my daughter in December of 2019, and then that girl resigned two months later. Uh, So you can imagine that that was really stressful. Um, She had been with the company for over six years, so I definitely thought she would be committed for the duration of at least, you know, eight, eight months, 12 months. Like, I thought she was really committed in the very long term. And I just kind of had a little bit of a minor meltdown. I was like, I can't run this business with an infant at home. Like we very much needed leadership in the office. We were busy. Um, I didn't necessarily feel that anyone on the existing team had the leadership qualities that I was looking for. So I hired a mergers and acquisitions company to sell the business. And then COVID happened. So we went into lockdown two to three weeks after I listed it. So good luck trying to sell an events company when you can't host events. So that was a bit of a back and forth over the span of two years. And then I guess it was last fall, I spoke to the mergers and acquisitions company about targeting businesses that I thought could just assimilate us. Like if they're already a big and busy business, the main focus would be the website and the lead gen that would come through that because we've spent a lot of time on SEO and had, you know, seven to 800 quotes a year leading into COVID. We were still getting a lot of opportunities there. They didn't, I mean, I don't know how far they took it. It didn't materialize into any opportunities, but the one girl that I kept through all of this um, ended up resigning in January. So I felt like my back was against the wall. Like I, I didn't necessarily feel like I had it in me to build it up to what it once was without her. I didn't necessarily feel like I could do it on my own and all of that. So I basically got a mutual release from that company and I just started targeting the agencies myself. I had calls with 12 to 15 companies in about three weeks narrowed it down, had about six that were interested, got four offers and I had it sold within two weeks. <laughs> so wow. that was amazing. that uh, the new companies kind of hit the ground running. I'm still CC'd on emails in case they require any support or they need background for clients. Otherwise, anyone that new coming through the website, they just introduce them and explain kind of what happened with the merger and transition and, and off they go. That's amazing. I mean, just, uh, you know, like, if, if you sell a house in like two weeks, people are like, wow, that's amazing. But like to sell mm-hmm. a business in two weeks, like that, that's next level. So uh, congratulations. Yeah, it was swift. And we had to move swift because we were starting to get all these big quotes coming in. And I was like, I can't do this on my own. I just can't scale back up quickly enough to accommodate kind of where we left off two years ago. Got it. Okay, perfect. So in that case, uh, if you want to bring us back to the the present, right? So you, you have this very big, uh, you know, exciting exit. Uh, what brings you here today? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, a weird transition has been the fact that, you know, I felt like I built up my reputation and my career in this one particular industry. So I'm known for events and event planning and staffing and all of those things. And then you kind of step into real estate and it uh, obviously I have investing experience. I've bought and sold homes myself. Um, I've done a lot of different things there, but you're technically still new. Like I can't say I've got 10 sales under my belt, a hundred sales under my belt, the way that I did with my other business that, you know, to compare them. Um, if someone doesn't ask, I'm not necessarily like I'm brand new. And that's kind of helped obviously land some clients because they still perceive me as professional and, and doing all of that. But if they ask and they're kind of comparing me to, a realtor who door knocked a week ago that can say they've done all these thousands of transactions that 
it's hard to kind of stack up with your value. So I've been trying to find like what my unique value proposition is and like, why would they go with me being someone a little bit more new in the field compared to someone that does have more of that experience. So. Got it. And where does that line of thinking bring you to? Yeah. I mean, I've been trying to think of like the right approaches to it. If someone does kind of stack you up with those questions. And I think sometimes it's like, because I, I had my own business for so long, you know, I was never comfortable really cold calling. What we ended up doing to really build the business was working on targeted keyword research and SEO. So with real estate, I, I'm working towards some of those things, but at the same time, it's almost like, I don't know if it's pride or lack of confidence, but it's like the idea of going door knocking just is not appealing to me. And that's obviously where you start when you want to build like locally in your own neighborhood and your community. Um, I've tried to do other things like with lead gen systems, with mail outs, you know, given the spend, like it really hasn't materialized into anything valuable. So that's really expensive to take that approach. So I'm just trying to find this happy medium of like, how do I connect with people in the community without necessarily like literally going door to door? <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out what the best approach is for me. Got it. So tell me more about this aspect of like, it's either pride or lack of confidence to do cold call, right? Because yeah. <clears throat> that was a pattern that showed up even in the previous business. And yeah. the path that you chose to maximize was the background one, right? Like yeah. I just optimize the keywords. That's in They came traffic. to us. It was just like, people looking for us will find us. Um, when I started out in the business, I was brought in for operations. So my partner at the time was the face of the business. She was selling all the opportunities. She was one dealing with clients. She also dealt with recruiting staff. And I then went and just did all the work. You know what I mean? So now I'm kind of back in that situation where you need to have the leads. Like I'm perfectly confident I can service everything they need, but it's just finding now those people um, to work with. So, um, you know, digital marketing was a great way to push out that content to attract those opportunities, but now I'm obviously starting over. Um, so it's just trying to, you know, just trying to figure that out. Got it. And, and I don't like to be sold to. So I think that's part of it. Like I hate when people come to my door. I never, ever answer the door. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, there's going to be people doing that to me. Like, I don't want to do some, I don't even like having done to myself. So I think that plays into it as well. Got it. Okay. So, because now there, there's like these recurring patterns, right? So there's one on like, when I was in the old business, I, through circumstance, got to really shine and use my gift in the background of the operation. Somebody mm -hmm. else was front facing, doing yeah. all of the visibility work and that worked mm -hmm. because there was a balance. Yeah. Now it's on me to do both and I don't have, you know, whatever, the leverage, the time, the circumstance to optimize for just being in the background. So before I continue, like, does that resonate with you? Yeah. I mean, my partner was obviously only involved for about four years, but by the time she left, we had built up enough clientele that I didn't really have to be cold calling. They just came to us. The SEO kind of came about when we lost our biggest client. So we had a huge telecom company that restructured. We lost like, you know, that was 60, 70% of our work. So that's why we started doing SEO. And then I just, you know, literally went full force with that, took a ton of courses. We really learned how to do it well. We started ranking for hundreds of keywords. So that brought us all these different opportunities. Um, and again, I just, even when it was following up, like I don't mind sending an email to a client, like to ask if an event's repeating, but I, I wouldn't, I was never comfortable, like even going to a trade show and trying to like, these trade go conversations, but the really act of soliciting and cold calling even if it's a client I had a relationship with, like I really just didn't like doing that. And I found that I would just procrastinate on it. So, <clears throat> so even calling a client, right. Who's, who's paid you money. Yeah. To just do strike what? a conversation between events to see what they have going on. Like, okay. So to buy, the hated that. Thing. If they reach out and they're like, Hey, I've got this going on. I'll pick up the phone instantly. Like, Oh, let's talk about your event. But if it was more like there's nothing happening and it's just like a checking call. Okay. So yeah. just, just so that I understand the situation. So it's like, it's not even to like, they're a former client and you're mm -hmm. calling to like buy the next thing. It's actually during the fulfillment, you're just calling to check in. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I don't, I, I mean that if, for example, like they did an event six months ago, we haven't heard from them. I don't necessarily like to just call them up. And sometimes it was just because they were maybe the reactions you get sometimes, like someone wasn't expecting the call from you. So they act kind of weird on their end. I would much prefer send the email to check in and see how they're doing rather than a phone call. Um, but if they were to reach out and say, hey, we've got this going on, like no problems. Like there's obviously like purpose directly at hand. 
it was easy to kind of field all of that stuff, but I definitely didn't like, you know, the follow-ups, you don't like to bother people, don't want it to be awkward. Um, so maybe I just never figured out the right techniques or the right way to, to handle that, but I just never got comfortable with that even after 18 years. Got it. And it, it just sounds like, like if you have the permission to speak, then you will do your thing. Yeah. Okay. And like, where else in your life do you find that pattern? Um, no, I mean, I've never liked confrontation. Um, so say even in relationships, like I would definitely, even with my husband, like we've been together for 15 years and if there was something really bothering me, we don't have disagreements or big problems often, but I might send him like a really lengthy email to outline like how I was feeling first, then to broach that conversation rather than just come up and start talking about it. And I'm improving. Like there was something that happened earlier this year that bothered me and I approached him. He's like, oh, I was waiting for that email. <laughs> I think he knew like something was bothering me, but actually like went and talked to him about it in that circumstance. So I'm trying to work on it, you know, with life and experience and all of that. But absolutely, I think I just never liked that side of it. So yeah, so it's like to, to be close to that energy where you go back and forth, potentially, it's like I feel mm -hmm. a lot safer and a lot more comfortable if there's some sort yeah. of distance between us right so like all the distance the and almost like you want it to come across the right way like you feel like if you just were to start saying it maybe you'd forget one of the points you want to make or it would come across the wrong way or something like that like you don't want someone to get defensive and just start throwing stuff back at you so if you write it it's easier to better articulate maybe some of the things that you're feeling at least for me that's how i would right look at it potentially control for the reaction of the other person Maybe. <laughs> right. So, okay. So what lands for that? Yeah. I mean, it could equally get taken out of context. Like there was times I sent that email and it was still, it was not taken the way that I intended. Um, so I think in looking at that, maybe I've tried to take a different approach as time has passed. Sure. Yeah. And that's fine. Like things will get lost in translation, especially with, you know, text as opposed to in person. So that, that makes <clears> sense. <throat> so the through line amongst all of these, right? That there is like a very visceral discomfort, almost fear of like, if I don't have the clear signal that I can approach this, mm -hmm. then I do everything I can to pull back and or control <laughs> for the variables. Yeah, quit it, yeah. control for the variables. If I really have to do this, so I'll... Yeah send out the perfect email that makes sure all the dots and things are crossed to the best of my ability at that time. Yeah. So first of all, okay. Does that resonate and sound accurate with you? Yeah. I think for the most part. Okay. What, what have I missed? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't think anything like even when I have had a conversation, I'm the queen of like, I'll always send a follow up to like reiterate what was discussed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was just always how I'd communicate kind of through writing. Um, so I think it was a combination of like being accurate and thorough and efficient. And then on the flip side, it's like, you know, just uh, you want people to take it the way that you're intending. Uh, maybe it also minimizes the possibility of like just the way rejection would be perceived. Like if you're going to call, like it's a different thing than how it's handled by email. Okay. And it's rejection of like your feeling of rejection, not theirs. Yeah. Okay. So in that instance, how would rejection be perceived by you? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. You just, it, it's a hard thing to really articulate, I guess. Like, it's just no one really likes feeling that way. It's like if you were to go and door knock and someone just like slams the door in your face or they get upset or, you know, whatever it may be, like you might have some really great conversations, but it might also be like really awkward or, you know, just however that may be. Sure. So are you okay if we dive a bit deeper mm -hmm. into that? Yeah. Okay. So when you think about the general discomforts of all of these situations, right? From the more direct ones, like somebody's rejecting you and slamming the door in your face, mm -hmm. to maybe more the mild ones from the past, like somebody, like I'm calling past clients to see if they want to book another show. Mm -hmm. What's the <clears throat> actual internal feeling? Or are they different in those instances? Yeah, you just feel like you're not good enough. I guess Not that could be <laughs> maybe part of it. Like, I feel like I've always been a bit of an overachiever. So, you know, you want to 
provide a service to someone that they like. And even with my marketing approach with real estate, I've taken more of the stance of like a lifestyle approach. Like you want to always be providing value to someone. And even if that means like, you know, it's a long sales cycle when it comes to real estate. Someone's probably not just like, I'm going to buy today and tomorrow and the next day. Like it's, you know, these could be year long life cycles. So I've taken the approach of like, I want to provide value, provide content people will find really interesting or they like, or it's entertaining. And that way, you know, my approach was love your home. I want you to love the home you're in as much as possible. And when the time comes that you want to find a new home to love, I want you to think of me. I just don't want it to be like buy and sold and stats and, you know, all the normal things that most realtors would put out there because I'm trying to build that long-term relationship with people by providing that value. Perfect. So <clears throat> beautifully articulated and a beautiful vision of like, okay, what do I want my brand and my next vision to be about? What I find interesting is that the original question had more to do with my sense of not feeling good enough. And where your brain went into was like, well, look how beautiful I'm going to build this thing to like prove yeah. that, that I am actually good. <clears throat> yeah. so, it's just kind of taking that approach to like, if I can't say I've got all these sales under my belt from like a metric standpoint, well, I can provide all of this value to just build credibility or show like what you're capable of, I guess, if you're lacking in another area. Right. So I'm compensating in yeah. some ways. <laughs> Okay. More or less. Yep. Okay. So what, what lands for you with that? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm just trying to do what I can until I have like more under my belt, I guess. Okay. So I just want to make the distinction clear between like competency and like self-worth, right? Do you right now feel like you could have a lot of self-worth even if your competency is low? Yeah, I think it's almost the opposite. Like, I feel like I'm very competent. Like, even though I don't necessarily have, like, as much of that experience, it's more like your self-worth attached to that because I know that I don't have all that experience. The self-worth would be a little bit lower. Right. Like, so I'm very confident in my competence, but the self-worth because I don't have the experience is low. It's the opposite to me, what you said. Okay, sorry. Does so that, that make again? sense? <laughs> like, I feel really confident in my capabilities. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's high, but my self worth is a little low because I just don't have as much experience as someone that's been doing this for five years or 10 years the way that I did in my past career. Okay. So my confidence is high. My belief potentially is high, but my self-worth is tarnished or diminished because my competency in this one particular new skill is <clears throat> low. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, the self-worth <clears throat> feeling that you would get from feeling good enough is very much tied to your competency in a particular area. Sounds right. Okay. And how does that yeah. feel? Hmm. I'm trying to think specifically, like Well, you don't need I to think, think of feeling. How does it feel? Yeah, I think you just well, like you said, the self worth being low, like it just doesn't feel good. Like you feel like you're not again good enough. And that's where I need to get out of my own way. Cause you're like, okay, I just gotta suck it up and do this. Like whether it's making the phone calls, walking around my neighborhood, you know, handing out business cards and just connecting with people and stuff like that. So it's like I know I'm capable of doing, it. I just have to like rip the band aid off and go do it, you know? But it's just getting to that point it hasn't right. arrived yet. <laughs> so it's like I'm so. going to outwork and outthink my sense of self worth. Yeah. Like when I and I think once you've rest. done it a few times, you'll be fine. It's just getting it to like they say the hardest part is starting. Right. The first one will be the hardest. Like I think it's just overcoming that barrier to to do that. Sure, and I completely agree with you. Actually, like in terms of the whatever you want to call it, the mechanics of getting competent. Mm -hmm. I think your head's in, in a perfect place. I think you're looking in the right places. It all makes sense from like a skill acquisition competency perspective. Mm -hmm. The reason why I keep coming back to here is I think your, your, your brain right now is very much tied to my competency equals my self-worth. And what I'm trying to point to you is like, that's a potentially fragile place <clears throat> to be. 
Like, what if tomorrow something else happens where you can't work? Right? Well, I mean, that's really been what I've been dealing with in the last little while, because like I said, my daughter was born just before COVID. So I got my license last year. I knew I couldn't really start working right away. Um, there was some personal things in my family that happened and, you know, just her daycare situation. It's like, she's fine for two weeks and then she's sick and then I'm sick. So there's been all these things that interfere with actually getting started consistently. Um, so that's been an ongoing challenge, but that's where when you read my bio, for example, like I do a lot of private lending and real estate investing. So I've had enough passive income to support me through this transition to this point. So at least I'm in a different place maybe than um, some other people, but that's just been an ongoing challenge. Like if you, <clears throat> before I had her, like when I had my business, I could work 60 hours a week if I needed to, like you do everything you need to, to get things done. But then you've got this little person in the equation and, you know, there's all these other factors that you don't want to say get in the way, like you're prioritizing them as your family, but it does make it a lot harder, um, you know, to have that consistency. Like I might think for this week, I've got all these things I plan to do. And then that would get derailed if all of a sudden she got sick or I got sick because everything changes in that circumstance. Of course, like you're, you're taking <clears throat> care of a little human, right? So like yeah. that, that's going <laughs> to throw a wrench in, in a lot of, uh, you know, the scheduling and productivity bit. So mm -hmm. I understand that completely. Yeah. Um, what I would just want to rewind back to is even in that description, right? What you said was like, okay, so I'm in this very good position because I've invested in real estate for a long time. I have all this passive income coming in. I have all these systems like, come, like that was an offshoot kind of like a, a side of this whole discussion, right? When like, that is the dream that so many people <laughs> looking to get into real estate have, yet yeah. your brain discounted that as like, but that's not, like I haven't sold 10 houses. I haven't sold yeah, 100 I houses, so therefore I'm not good enough. Meanwhile, you're living the dream that people who sell 100 houses want to have. I know, I know. Right. And it's like, I, it's given me this freedom in the last few years that I wouldn't have had. Like I stopped drawing an income from my business and we couldn't operate. So it's, I'm very grateful for all of the decisions that I made, but it's not something you necessarily lead with when you're meeting somebody for the first time to talk about selling their house or right. buying and or something, right? It might be true. <laughs> so. Like it might be true because <clears throat> you technically haven't tested it. So you don't yeah. actually know. But I think the more important part here is like, even when I gave you this compliment or like acknowledge, like, you're living the thing that so many people want to live. <laughs> so there's opportunity right there. Yeah. Right. Potentially. But it's like, where did your brain go? It's like, oh, no, no, but, but, but like I'm discounting. Yeah. How I don't good know. I've actually created it. Yeah. Okay. So do you see how it goes always back to the through line? Like your filter for how you respond to compliments in this instance, subsequently <laughs> how you make decisions. Right. Potentially where you're looking to create problems right? Like maybe your opportunity isn't like, Hey, I already have invested experience in 10 years. I'm not a realtor. Like I can show you what to do. Maybe the opportunity is there. It's like, but I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at the place where I lack. Yeah. I lack <clears throat> in selling houses. Yeah. Right. Do you see how that lens of I'm not good enough is. But I think that's what a lot of people of focus on, right? Like they'll focus on their sore spots or where their weaknesses are more than they'd be like, oh, but I've done all these great things. Like you'll still go back to be like, but this needs work, you know? Right. And is that working <laughs> for you? Well, I mean, it's, I think it's helpful to acknowledge um, what you need to work on and what you need to change. Cause that's how you improve it. It's just trying to come up with like the right, Agreed. whether it's tactics or motivation or whatever it is to. So let me put it a different way. Is it working for your peace of mind? I mean, I don't sit there and like sweat about it. Like I know the reality of my circumstances. Like if I'm, my, have my daughter home because she's sick and I'm sick. I'm not going to be like, ah, oh, but I didn't door knock today. Like I don't beat myself up about it. But when I look at the longer, you know, period of time, for example, and I'll give a good example. Like I, this hit me hard and this is perfect to this. I just transitioned brokerages. And when I sent my resignation to the brokerage I'd been with, um, one of the people I emailed made the mistake of responding back to the other person and accidentally CCing me on it. So I, I don't know what the original email said. It must have said something about like losing me or whatever. And she kind of replied to the effect of like, no, not at all. Like she wasn't even willing to build her business. And I was like, but you don't even know like what I had dedicated time and money towards. And I just responded back to the the other person and just said I had received that email, clearly an error. 
And, you know, I've really been prioritizing my family. I was very transparent with the brokerage about that when I started, that I wouldn't have a lot of time in the beginning to get things rolling. But it was just a very inaccurate um, assumption to make because she had no idea, like, uh, I've invested in, like, this lead gen system, all these months of uh, mail outs and things like that. But it just hurt me because I'm like, oh, I know I'm not where I want to be. Like, I had a goal of X number of transactions. And, you know, I would beat myself about up about that but then to have them also say that it just like reinforced like I'm not where I want to be in that area you know what I mean so it just um yeah it was a a tough thing to swallow I guess sure so okay I'm gonna <clears throat> kind of take this in a bit of a different direction so who or what would you be if you lost the ability to think I'm not good enough <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I guess you could get really lazy or it could be really productive. It could go either way. <laughs> okay, so pause right there, right? If your brain lost the ability to ever consider the possibility that I wasn't good enough, mm -hmm. who or what would I be is potentially lazy. Well, you can get complacent and be like, oh, I'm perfectly good with where I am. Right. So or you could be like, okay, I the barrier to go out and do some of these things is gone. So then you just go do them. So I guess. Okay. <laughs> so your vision beyond I'm not good enough and subsequently self-worth is again, completely and utterly tied to productivity. I yeah. it would be uh, one of the other extreme. I would either be, you know, a stoner sitting on my couch doing nothing or, yeah. you know, I, I would just be hustling and making a whole lot of stuff happen. Yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds strange. Like I'm definitely like one of those, you know, to do list people, you know, I have a goal list that I start at the beginning of every year. Like I very much tie all those things together with like what I would like to achieve. Um, and it's just knowing that you're not there yet or didn't happen in the time frame you wanted. Like I'll beat myself up about it a little bit. Sure. So do you see that there exists any space for you to have value and worth and a sense of good enough if it isn't tied to work? I find it hard. <laughs> okay. So why? Yeah, I don't know. I think I've always been that way, even thinking back to when I was like much younger in school. Like, you know, I always was like a very, very hard worker. Like, um, you know, I think I knew at a young age, like nothing was going to be handed to me. I lived with, um, you know, not my parents uh, for a good period of time from me, like the age of 12 to 17. So you know that nothing would be handed to you. So it was kind of like gave you this different perspective and outlook with the things that you had to like go out and do to provide for yourself. Um, and that kind of led into other things. So I think it just, it's maybe all like very deep rooted just because of just the way that those circumstances kind of played out and stuff like that. So I think it's, there <laughs> deeply a hundred percent and i appreciate so, you how you sharing. disentangle that i don't know i mean well it's, it's up to you like do you feel yeah. like there's something that was untangled there or do you feel like it's just an answer well it's just hard to ever um look at things differently right like if you're not out there like producing or achieving like it was almost like a survival skill right so it's like hundred okay well if i'm not doing this i always look at things from the worst case scenario like what if you know, I do all this private lending. What if those opportunities disappear tomorrow and I had no income? Like, you know, you want to have this. And like, even when I look back to the events, I, again, I'm so grateful I started doing these things because who knew COVID was coming and, you know, business you worked almost 20 years on could suddenly not operate. Like who would have predicted that? Like I would have been really screwed had I not learned all of these things and set up these opportunities. Right. So you always look at things like, well, if this hadn't happened. So I always like to just, you know, have things moving in different areas so that you're always, um, you know, you're never not providing for yourself. And in this case, now providing for my family. Absolutely. So first thing I want to acknowledge is A, your like propensity to to, to share that because this is something that's inherent in so many entrepreneurs and like high achievers, like this, this big, big close tie to identity and productivity and output and results. So yeah. <laughs> I commend you for, for diving into that. Number one, number two, there are a lot of gifts to having that mentality, right? Like everything you just described of like 
so much of my life and the results that I've gotten have been optimized due to the circumstances I had to face and persevere through. And they're very good, tangible results, very good, tangible comforts, very good established things that I've created as a result of all of this. Mm -hmm. So my questions to you and why I keep bringing it back to this is less about the efficacy Mm -hmm. of how you got here and the thinking that got you here Mm -hmm. because it it worked. It worked really well. It's more about what are your desires and visions on going forward, right? Because you could spend the rest of your life repeating the same achievement thing while never really addressing the root motivation for them. Because even when Mm -hmm. you talked about like, okay, well, how did I get here? Like you mentioned it yourself, like this was a survival strategy. I I knew nothing was ever going to be handed to me. So it was either crumble or go all in and succeed. And you did. And that's a beautiful thing. But now that you're here, it's kind of like, is that the most peaceful and best way to proceed Mm -hmm. when you go to build this next thing? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, um, I think one thing I've been really happy about is the fact that I've, you know, and they talk about financial freedom and to me, financial freedom is really attached to the time. So by doing all of these things, it's given me all of this time that I had with my daughter that I never would have had. And I mean, COVID was almost like one of those blessings in disguise because my business that was super busy kind of, you know, slowed right down, like for very extended periods of time. And it gave me that gift of time with her that I wouldn't have also had if I didn't have all this other passive income. Like, I mean, I would have needed an income of some kind. If it wasn't my business, it maybe would have had to have been something else. So I think that, you know, you kind of reached this pinnacle, but then you also kind of made this decision to go down this path. You know, I didn't necessarily um, get my license, just do nothing with it. And I kind of walk that line of, you know, I'd like to build it there, but it also walks that parallel line of investment and where I plan to take my, my plans in that side. Um, And I I feel like I've become a little bit spoiled with kind of that work-life balance, right? Like I worked for about six months and then took the better part of the summer off to spend that with my family. And I think it's nice to kind of move at that pace. And I just have to, you know, you kind of have to stop comparing yourself to the people out there that are these super high producers, because I'm sure the compromise with them would be potentially their time. Like how much are they seeing their family? Like how many holidays are they going on and, and things like that. So I think I just have to reframe, you know, what's most important and, and not really get caught up with comparing myself in those situations. Sure. So then if you kind of segue off of that point, when you look at this through line, of I'm not good enough. And like the, the value the the self value tied to the production and the results like in your words, if you zoomed out 30,000 feet, like how is this actually a problem in your business <clears throat> right now? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not truly a problem. I mean, it would be more of a problem just in terms of landing different clients. But I think for some of the clients that I have worked with and have had conversations with, I think they see that added value when I start to talk to them about some of these other strategies and ways that it can potentially help them in their own lives. And you know, I have one woman that I've been speaking to since January, and she's been very, very open with me about the fact that she's probably talked to 10 other realtors. But I feel like even though she knows I don't have the experience, she's still like super attached to me. And I've done all these other things to hold her hand and help her and, you know, spoken to her about all these other possible strategies she can incorporate because she's getting to her retirement years, she's going to need other sources of income and stuff like that. And it's just put me in a different category, maybe compared to some of those realtors, because I'm offering all of this added help and information and support. And they're just like, just want to sell our house. Right. So I'm trying to distinguish myself in that way. And, um, you know, by participating even on podcasts like this one and others, it's like, it helps to reinforce um, some of those ways that I'm different. And, you know, I think it'll all fall into place. It's just (laughs) working towards those goals. Fair enough. So in that instance, literally the very thing we mentioned before where it's like hold on so i have all this like 10 years of investing experience that i could draw on this woman likes you because you have that experience right but your brain still focused on the lack of experience you have in selling because they'll talk about it and you know what i mean <laughs> it's right. like cuz they'll still, because fine, they're but... trying to make that decision it's like okay well am i am i in better hands with this person or with this person based on what their 100%. experience is so but look at it again, right? 
Because A, your brain goes, what will the other person will say this, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, I need the external to validate me so that I'm okay. Yeah. Meanwhile, if this woman is talking to 10 other realtors, but is kind of leaning towards you because of the investment experience you have, Mm -hmm. what difference does it make that somebody sold 25 houses if you've invested and have passive income coming over the past 10 years? Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And that's the thing. I think the irony with this industry in particular is that all these people be like, this sold this much over asking or this, that. And it's like, that's not a reflection of how great your marketing is. Everyone's doing the same marketing. It's just the circumstances of lack of supply and it's driven up the demand. And, you know, there's all these things. And then now it's kind of like those same realtors are probably struggling to sell what would have sold in like two days, 10 months ago. Right. So people usually advertise and market it like they're this amazing realtor because of how quickly things were selling it really had not much to do with them yeah, it's, it's just the, yeah. the circumstances in the market right so i think you try to just um you know shed some of the reality of those things on whoever you're talking to so that you know i'm not going to undermine the fact someone could be a great realtor and have great connections and things like that but there's obviously a lot of other factors at play with how successful someone's going to be in 100 in that and I think that's a beautiful thing because like, obviously you're focusing on something that's deeper than the transaction, right? And I, th- I think mm-hmm. that's very palpable to certainly to myself and I think anybody listening. So to just kind of go back to the whole sentiment of like zooming out. So like, okay, this sense of I'm not good enough, like whatever, it's, it's powering my propensity to go and put more reps into this and get better at it. Fair. It's not really a problem in my business right now. I just need to figure out the marketing bit. Do you think it's a problem within like how you feel, how you show up, et cetera? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think I show up just uh, almost the same way I would have in my business meetings with my old company, right? I come prepared with as much information as I can. I try to lead by asking questions. And I think that's even with my old business, like how we landed certain things because they actually didn't know anything about us. Like we would just, you control the conversation by asking all those questions and people like to talk about themselves or their companies. And, you know, ultimately it, it led to some of those opportunities. And then they don't necessarily know if you have a year's experience or 10 years or 20 years, like, because all you've done is talk about them. And then you frame what you're talking about around like the information that they're providing you with. You're trying to be like manipulative or anything, but you really just make it about them as much as you can. And it kind of takes it off of you. Got it. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. Um, Yeah, I mean, so from my perspective, kind of like from the outside, like looking in, for you really, this comes down to, I believe there's a part of you that is really... Like you see the patterns, like the self-awareness here is, is like palpable. Like it's like, you know, okay, like I, I, I'm afraid of- I know of it's not my strength. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. I, I know it's not my strength. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Like yeah. I, I think you, I'm actually acknowledging how I, yeah. I think that as far as like using your natural smarts, your natural observations to like see the patterns, mm-hmm. I think it's there. I, I don't think that's really the blind spot because when you talk about like the, you know, how do I connect to people going door to door? I see that I have this- fear of rejection. Um, you know, I was able to make my previous business by not having to face and deal with any of these things. Mm-hmm. Like even now, like, a, you know, I realize I discount certain areas where I actually have strengths because of this other thing. Right. But so the, the patterns are very palpable. What I'm just going to kind of invite you to consider and for you to consider opening the door to is really looking at who would you be if your sense of self-worth wasn't defined or as closely tied to how it is that I output? What is my Mm -hmm. performance? What is my productivity? What are my results? And the reason that I would invite you to look there is because despite your awareness of all of the patterns, which is really good, whenever I would throw a question your way to dive into that distinction. The immediate place your brain goes to <laughs> is the exact same pattern that you mentioned around like, okay, well, how do I deal with confrontation? I prefer to send an email. I want to like bullet point and make sure all the things are covered. <laughs> like, like, I try to remove myself away from that. Yeah. 
And as you mentioned before, there's, there's a very good reason for that, right? My past is one that forced me to really get good at this part, to really optimize this part, to really be tough. And you, met, you said it yourself, it's a survival, like I had to do this to survive. And I think those pieces are so deep rooted that they are really scared to see, like if I let this go, then the very thing that allowed me to survive when I was the most vulnerable are going to be put into question, right? And since that part generally is going to be formed when you were in those young formative years, mm -hmm. it's freaking out, right? So it's <laughs> easier to be like, well, just do this other thing of like deflection and avoidance and whatever, because whatever, that kept us safe. It's uncomfortable, but it, it's doable. We'll get the result anyway, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, I don't want to belabor that point, but how does all of that land for you? Yeah, I, I think you're on point with all of that. It's just trying to figure out a way to to change that like I, I'm not really sure how I'd approach that well I mean th th that's exactly what I do uh in, in my <laughs> programs that's a much more uh detailed discussion and, and process than obviously we could do today um but as far as like the awareness piece or, or getting some clarity on that does that feel complete for you is there still something left outstanding no I think that definitely sums it up Okay, perfect. So then why don't you just kind of begin to close us off in your words? Like, <clears throat> what did you come into this conversation thinking were like the the business problems or things you needed to solve? And what were any of the aha moments as a result of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I think that I wasn't 100% sure what to expect. Um, you know, like I said, I, I can understand when you talk about the business problems or me problems. Like I think for anyone, it's probably a bit of a, a combination of both. Uh, but I think it's important not to necessarily attach your worth only to that one area when you've got other things to consider, which is important. Um, and at the end of the day, it's just a matter of trying to get out of your way to to do what you need to do. Yeah, 100%. So beautifully summarized as, as expected. So uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, then if you can just close this off, let everybody know. Uh, you know, where to find you, who's the best person yeah. to find you, the floor is yours for that. Yeah. So I have a couple of pages dedicated, uh, one obviously to real estate. So it's under my name, Serena Holmes Realtor. Uh, and then I also have one that's dedicated to my book. I know we didn't really talk about that in too much detail, but I published a book last October called The Accidental Entrepreneur. And I have that on social at Serena Holmes Author. And I share a combination of business anecdotes, um, personal stories, challenges, inspiration, a number of readings from the book and things like that on that page. Beautiful. Well, we'll include all of those uh, in the show notes as always. But uh, Serena, thank you very much for coming on and being as vulnerable as you were. Um, right. And yeah, for everybody else listening, we'll see you on the next one. Great. Thank you.